January 5th, the night before the Electoral College votes were to be counted in Congress, Donald Trump told Mike Pence that he could and should reject Biden electors. Page 228. That is all I want you to do, Mike, Trump said. Let the House decide the election. What do you think, Mike? Trump asked. Pence returned to his mantra. He did not have the authority to do anything other than count the electoral votes. Well, what if these people say you do? Trump asked, gesturing beyond the White House to the crowds outside. Raucous cheering and blasting bullhorns could be heard through the Oval Office windows. If these people say you had the power, wouldn't you want to, Trump asked? I wouldn't want any one person to have that authority, Pence said. But wouldn't it almost be cool to have that power, Trump asked? No, Pence said. Look, I've read this and I don't see a way to do it. We've exhausted every option. I've done everything I could and then some to find a way around this. It's simply not possible. My interpretation is no. I've met with all of these people, Pence said. They're all on the same page. I personally believe that these are the limits to what I can do. So if you have a strategy for the sixth, it really shouldn't involve me because I'm just here to open the envelopes. You should be talking to the House and Senate. Your team should be talking to them about what kind of evidence they're going to present. No, 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 Trump shouted. You don't understand, Mike. You can do this. I don't want to be your friend anymore if you don't do this. You're not going to be sworn in on the 20th. There is not a scenario in which you can be sworn in on the 20th and said, we need to figure out how to deal with it, how we want to handle it, how we want to talk about it. Trump's voice grew louder. You are weak. You lack courage. You've betrayed us. I made you. You were nothing, Trump said. Your career is over if you do this. Pence did not budge. A Pence advisor, Tom Rose, saw Pence leave the Oval Office. One of Pence's closest friends, Rose, later told others that Pence looked chalk white, like someone who had received terrible news at a hospital. Once Pence left, Trump opened a door near the Resolute desk. A rush of cold air blasted the room. Trump left the door open. The muffled soundtrack of excited screams and yells from his supporters filling the room. The noise outside grew louder, almost like a party. Isn't that great? Trump exclaimed. Tomorrow is going to be a big day. Leading off our discussion tonight, Bob Woodward, two-time Pulitzer Prize winning author and associate editor of the Washington Post, where he has worked since 1971, and Robert Cust, a national political reporter for the Washington Post. They are the co-authors of the new, already bestseller, Peril. Uh, Bob Woodward, let me begin with you, and that scene just described, just uh, it, it, it's, it's in your book, on January 5th, this is the night before what became an attack on the Capitol, and there's the President of the United States believing and insisting to his Vice President that he can change the outcome of the presidential election the next day. Mike Pence saying, I've tried, in effect. I've hoped that I could find a way to do that, and I can't find it. And that's how close we came to a different electoral college count in the Congress the next day. Yes, more than that, uh, actually the legitimacy of the presidency was at stake because if Pence had wavered at all and stood there uh, in the Senate and the House and said, I can't decide, I'm going home, we would have had a constitutional crisis like we've never seen before in this country. But Pence did stick to the law and the Constitution, but it was not a direct path. And uh, the reporting that Bob Costa and I did shows very clearly that Pence was looking, looking for a way to accommodate Trump. In the end, I think uh, pressure from lawyers and friends and advisors and Pence's own sense of conservative republicanism was, okay, I'm going to do the right thing here. But it, it was not a sure call at the beginning. 
And Robert Costa, there's a scene in the book of, uh, of Mike Pence calling former Republican Vice President Dan Quayle to get his advice about this. Uh, Dan Quayle uh, had that job uh, in 1993, uh, I guess it was, where they failed in their re-election campaign and he, as Vice President, had to deliver, uh, basically open the envelopes, as they put it, open the envelopes showing that Bill Clinton won. Indeed, January 6, 1993, Dan Quayle as vice president certifying the victory on that day for then President Clinton, President uh, Vice President Gore. And he, he's largely disappeared from the American political scene in, in recent decades, but he remains close to his fellow Hoosier and fellow Republican Mike Pence. And this is one of the calls Pence made during this transition period, trying to figure out how to navigate the dynamics, the pressure for President Trump. And Vice President Quayle, based on our reporting, kept telling Pence, you can't do this, Mike. We're friends. We're both Indiana Republican vice presidents. You just can't move forward. And Bob Woodward and I were talking recently about that January 5th scene, too, Lawrence. And the most striking scene to me is after Pence leaves the Oval Office on January 5th. We have in our book President Trump opening the door on a freezing night, January 5th, with the future rioters outside, uh, his, his supporters outside in the streets of Washington, and in the frigid air, having the gusts of air come into the Oval Office, and he wouldn't close the door. He said to his aides in the Oval Office, listen to them. These are my supporters. They want us to act tomorrow on January 6th. And even some of his own aides were shivering in the Oval Office that night. The president wouldn't close the door. He wanted to hear the cries of his supporters. Yeah, it, and it's a chilling scene uh, for the reader. It, it is so cinematic, because, and you do this in so many scenes where you take us beyond uh, the important text. There's always an important text in the room of what was said, but then there's more. Uh, in that room than, than what was said. And, and that, for me, is what the book is about. That's what distinguishes the book in so many ways from the news accounts and why you really, to get the full picture of any one of these moments, you really have to hold the book in your hands and see uh, everything that occurred in these rooms. Uh, Bob Woodward, the, the danger of nuclear war is something that has been... Uh, there's, there's two moments that we're aware of, and we're aware of them from your reporting. Uh, one from the final days of Richard Nixon, uh, where you and Carl Bernstein reported on, on the end of the Nixon presidency and how there was concern and worry in the administration about would Richard Nixon, uh, in order to try to save his presidency through crisis, possibly launch some kind of nuclear attack. Uh, and that is echoed in this book. Well, it actually happened. Uh, uh, Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, internally with the senior staff developed this notion of uh, the absolute darkest moment of theoretical possibility. In other words, uh, he had to look at the bad things that could happen, and he realized after a very long call where we have the transcript in the book with uh, Speaker Pelosi, and Pelosi is saying, you have got to find some way to guarantee that Trump's not going to start a war or use nuclear weapons. And Milley is pushing back in the call, and then he realizes Pelosi's right, I've got to do something. And uh, in one of the most dramatic findings in the reporting that Bob Costa and I did, Millie actually calls in the people from the war room in the Pentagon called the National Military Command Center and into his office. Uh, a one-star admiral or uh, one-star brigadier general in the army and some colonels, and he says to them, I want you to make sure if there's an order, just not for the new, uh, use of nuclear weapons, but any sort of military action, that I will be included. You call me. And he literally goes around the room and looks each person in the eye and says, have you got that? Have you got that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And 
This uh, is equivalent to what Secretary of Defense Schlesinger did in the Nixon years, uh, insisting that he be involved. In this case, Milley stepped in because the uh, acting Secretary of uh, Defense, Chris Miller, at that point, had just been uh, appointed and uh, Pelosi didn't trust Miller. Uh, I think Milley was not sure. So he seized this moment in, uh, in a way to protect the country from this theoretical possibility of a catastrophe. And, and, and Lawrence, just ahead, real Robert. quick, just jump in on that. I think it's very important for people to read the full book to get the context of what Chairman Milley was doing. Page 129 is so important. When he reaches out to General Lee, the Chinese general, he's trying to make it seem like a routine call, and these calls can be routine between chairman and foreign military leaders. But he's trying to reassure him when he says, we're, not, we're gonna let you know if we're going to attack at some point, that this is how it's always been throughout history. Read the full conversation. He's trying to calm down General Lee and the Chinese during a very tense situation uh, just days before the election, October 30th, 2020. And the whole book is about the context of our reporting and not just things that are pulled out or cherry-picked. We're going to have to squeeze in the commercial uh, break right here.